Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Don Coleman Lee, and I am the Education Activity Specialist for Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens. And I am going to be opening today, um, just introducing a series. So this is the 2022 Brown Bag Lunch and Learn series. And it's put on in collaboration um, with our city of Birmingham stormwater management, um, Jefferson County Commission, city of Leeds, the stormwater management authority Alabama Green Industry, Alabama Cooperative Extension, and Jefferson County Department of Health, along with Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens. And today we have Janika Smith with Jefferson County Department of Health here to introduce our speaker for today. Well, hello everyone. My name is Janika Smith. I work for the Jefferson County Department of Health Watershed Protection Program. The Watershed Protection Program provides stormwater services to Stormwater Management Authority Incorporated member cities. Um, there are 22 cities that share the cost to meet their National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, known as the MPDS permit, issued by the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, known as ADEM and the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. The MPDS permit regulates the stormwater discharges from the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, known as the MS4, in order to protect our water quality and people's health. These services include educational outreach, water monitoring, storm drain mapping, screening of outfalls, high-risk inspections, and record keeping. Now, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce Ms. Allison Chabelle. Uh, Allison is a graduate, from the, a graduate of Mississippi State University and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Ornamental Horticulture and holds a uh, Master of Science degree in Plant and Soil Sciences from Alabama A&M University. She worked at Huntsville Botanical Gardens for 10 years as a horticulture specialist and has been with the Alabama Cultural Extension System as a regional agent for the home grounds and natural resource management since 2014 in both Morgan and Lawrence counties. Now, Allison, I will turn it over to you. Allison, you're muted. That was a rookie mistake. I'm sorry about that. I should do better. Um, I thank you all for joining us today uh, for this presentation. So as part of my um, programming efforts, um, I not only talk about home horticulture, but I also talk about natural resource management. And one of the programs that we do is called the uh, EMEP program, E-Waste Management Education Program. Um, and, and in that program, we talk about um, the importance of recycling electronics and the best way to recycle electronics, just all the best management practices that go along with electronics and using them and disposal. Um, and so today, uh, our topic is going to be electronic waste, six tips for reducing waste. So we're going to talk about electronics waste. Um, I hope that by the end of today, you'll know why it's a problem and then what you can do from an individual's perspective to address the problem. So I'm going to turn off my um, I'm going to turn off my video so that uh, I'm not in the way here so you can see the screen really well. Um, and so then we'll go, to hit, go ahead. Uh, so electronic waste, just kind of let's start off with what it is. So it's anything that's outdated or broken that's electronic. Um, it's products that are used for data processing, telecommunications, entertainment, or utility in homes or businesses. So it's a really broad field. And the thing about it is it's growing um, by leaps and bounds more so than any other uh, field of wastes. Um, this, this, the electronic waste is the one that's growing, uh, increasing exponentially every year as we get more um, electronically minded. So electronic waste can include things. This is just a short list. So computers, tablets, cell phones, computer monitors, TVs, 
gaming systems, laptops, printers, DVD players, VCR players, if you have one of those still, uh, fax machines, those are getting outdated, but they still show up uh, in a lot of businesses. Uh, cable TV, uh, TV equipment, computer cords, and other computer equipment, and then also appliances. So it could be, you know, it's, it's a very broad field. And so the problem is that it's a growing, you know, it's a growing field of waste, but we really haven't figured out any way to handle it after we dispose of it. What, what should that end of life look like? Well, we haven't figured that out as a world yet. Um, this is older data, this is from 2013. So this is pre-smart devices before the Alexas and the smart plugs and all of that. Um, the average American household had 28 electronic products in that household. Um, now this is almost 10 years old, so let's look. I just took a second and I wrote down a bunch of things that are encompassed in the electronic waste um, department here. And just take a look at this and see how many of these, just do a quick count and uh, see how many of these you have in your home. And if you would, maybe we could stick it in the chat box and then we'd all know um, how many of these things that you have in your home. This is kind of room by room. <laughs> what I was thinking of in my house. I'll give you another couple of seconds to kind of add all those things up. So I did a, a tally for myself and my family is me and my husband and my daughter. There's just three of us and the, the daughter's only 11. So she's not super connected yet, but we have 39 of these things. These are just, um, this isn't work related either. This is, it doesn't count the things that I have at my work office. Um, so 39, okay. Somebody says 41, uh, Friends of Birmingham says around 20. So, I, I, I mean, it starts to really add up. Um, the, the number of electronic products that you have in your house. And, you know, we get more every year and, you know, some of those, those um, die every year and we have to replace them. So we're, we are producing a good bit of electronic waste. Um, so the problem is that we don't have a proper disposal stream um, installed yet in, in the United States. Um, so electronics usage increases every year because of global economic development, uh, industrialization of developing nations, enhanced living standards, um, higher levels of disposable income, growing urbanization and mobility. And I think we could add another one on to there, uh, being connected due to COVID, you know, um, that's definitely increased the amount of electronics many people have had. Uh, and all of that increased use equates to increased waste. So um, I, I was doing some research on this topic and I found this really good website. Uh, it's called the Global E-Waste Monitor. It's a uh, globalewaste.org. And it says in 2019, which I, I think of as the last normal year that we had, um, the world generated uh, 53 megatons of e-waste. That's an average of 7.3 kilograms per person. So uh, what that equates to uh, in the United States is 16, you know, we would say 16 pounds per person um, of e-waste is made per person per year. And that's, that, that's the whole world. So that's the uh, underdeveloped countries and the developing countries. So those numbers kind of pull the average per person uh, e-waste down. So um, that site also has some really great maps on there. And so I wanted to share these maps with you. So this is um, the e-waste generated per capita. And it just kind of uh, breaks it down by the country. And the darker the country is, the more e-waste each individual person produces. So if you look at this map, the United States and Canada are the darker green uh, in color as Australia is. And there's some other smaller countries up there um, as well. So 
looks like worldwide, you know, the U.S. is towards the top of the e-waste generation um, problem. So now let's look at, if you look up at the top and it's blue up there, it says uh, e-waste formally collected per capita. And so that's the e-waste that is collected by um, accredited um, uh, recyclers and regulated by environmental protection laws specifically designed for e-waste. So this is the regulated, formally collected stuff. And now look at the United States. Um, we are not collecting nearly as much as we are generating. So if you look here, we're kind of in that three to five kilograms per capita range, which is, uh, you know, basically six to 10 pounds is what we are, um, we are formally uh, recycling per person. That's, you know, we, we can do better. For sure, we could do better. So just to kind of pull that down um, to the United States specifically, here are very specific numbers for the United States. If you look, um, we are generating 7,000 kilotons, that's 7 million tons of e-waste uh, annually in the United States, and only about 15% of that is collected. So that equals one thousand kilotons. Um, so per person that equates to we are generating 46 pounds per person and we are collecting for recycling only seven pounds. So 15% is not much that we are collecting. We, we really should we really should be doing better than that. So part of the problem, part of the reason we're not doing better than only collecting 15% of the e-waste we are producing is that the U.S. has not developed a comprehensive waste management program. So if you look at the map here, uh, there's uh, states in red and states in gray. The states in red have e-waste legislation, whereas the states in gray do not. So I think until we figure this out as, you know, on a, on a US level, you know, we're gonna continue only recycling a small percentage of what we are creating. Um, you know, that right now, Alabama, uh, Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, all these states are left without a comprehensive plan. And they're, you know, the states and the municipalities are just have to figure it out for themselves. And um, so we really need to address this on more of a national level, I think. So because we're not effectively recycling our electronic waste, um, we're wasting a lot of resources. So let's look at what we find in electronic waste, okay? So here's our periodic table of elements on the right here. We're just gonna kind of go through these. So these items that I've highlighted in yellow, you can see there's the table and then we've highlighted them in yellow. These are the elements that are used in electronic waste, uh, excuse me, in electronics. So some of them are precious metals. These are the precious metals that we are using in our electronics. And then some of them are uh, elements that are in critical supply. Um, and so those are the ones that you see in brown, the elements that are in critical supply. And those are economically important and they have a high risk associated with their supply. So kind of breaking it down a little bit further. Um, you know, we talked about the um, critical supply, elements in critical supply. Well, these critical materials, the ones in brown over on the, on the map there, kind of fall into two different categories. One um, category of those are the energy critical elements. These are the things that we need um, to produce clean energy, uh, to produce it, transmit it, and store that clean energy. Things like silicon, indium, lithium, uh, terillium, all of those are used for solar panels and fuel cells and batteries for our phones and our electric cars. Um, and presently, uh, the majority of those um, are coming from other countries. They're not coming from the United States. Like Chile and Argentina account for about 60% of the worldwide lithium resources. Um, so you can see here some of those elements and um, the ones that are in critical supply up here. You see the importance to clean energy and their supply risk. So these four are very critical up here. 
um, and they're the most, um, we have the most supply risk associated with them. So the other category of critical materials uh, are rare earth elements. And these are things that are distributed um, either, there's not necessarily that they are um, in small amounts in the earth. It's just that they're distributed diffusely in the earth's crust. And because there's such small amounts of them um, distributed in the earth's crust, uh, they're difficult to extract. And, you know, you think about the way you would extract those would be through mining. And if you're having to mine larger areas to, you know, to extract the, the quantities of elements that you're looking for, you know, mining is terribly polluting. And it's, I mean, it's just, um, it, it just destroys an ecosystem. Uh, you know, it's very, very hard on the ecosystem where the mining is occurring. Um, so these elements, um, these rare earth elements are um, many of them because they're so difficult to mine um, are mined in other countries. You know, in 2020, China controlled 60% of the rare earth element production. 60% of those rare earth elements were coming out of China. Um, there's a hundred, the U.S. is 100% reliant on more than 14 of these uh, rare earth elements and 75% uh, reliant on imports for another 10. So we really need to figure out, you know, how to produce them more or how, how to mine them more in the United States so we have a better um, hold on those materials, but do it in a way that is um, not harmful to our environment. So those are the ones that are in critical supply, the critical materials in critical supply. And if you want more information on that, you can go to um, this hot off the press as of February. The USGS, US Geological Society, um, released a list of the 2020 critical minerals. They added, I think, like 15 this year. And so this list, if you go to the website there, um, it'll tell you all of the minerals that are uh, in critical supply, and then also how they are being used, what they're being used for. So uh, it was really interesting, um, you know, to, to kind of see what they were being used for. So you may want to go, go check that out. All right. So, you know, we talked about that there are minerals that we are basically throwing away, you know, things like gold and silver and lithium, all of those things that we, we are not getting back out of our electronics, we're basically disposing of them. Um, and a lot of those um, things when they get in the environment, some of those contaminants when they get in the environment, they can be hazardous to our health and to the health of the, the um, animals and the plants in that environment as well. So here are some of the electronic wastes, um, hazardous materials that can be found in electronic waste. So one that you see that comes from thermometers and laptops and fluorescent light bulbs is mercury. Uh, that causes, a, it affects the nervous system. Uh, arsenic is used for semiconductors and that causes lung cancer and damages nervous systems. And then cadmium is used in batteries and in uh, tube TVs. And that is, uh, it can cause harm to the liver and impair fetal growth. Some other hazardous materials that are in electronics would be lead. Uh, you know, the old TVs, the CRT TVs, all had leaded glass in them. They, uh, lead is also used in power cable sheathing and laptop displays, and that can harm the brain and kidneys. We all know about lead and the poisoning it can cause. Um, chromium is used in paints and primers and uh, the manufacturing of steel, stainless steels and alloys, and it can cause um, irritation to the lungs, throat, and nose. And then bromine, bromine is used as a flame retardant on quite a few electronics and in photography development, and it can affect the respiratory system. So these are all just, just a few of the electronic waste hazardous materials that you can come across. So we think, how do those things make it into our environment? Well, when you get done, maybe that cell phone breaks, you sort of have three options as to how to get rid of it. You throw it away, 
um, in the trash can. So that goes to the landfill. At the landfill, uh, that trash is compacted. And as it's compacted, everything's broken open um, and then gets rained on. And then when the rain hits it, um, it can dissolve minerals and leach and the, the minerals can uh, get caught up in that water, that rainwater, and gather at the bottom of the landfill in what's called the leachate. And a lot of times that leachate is taken um, for treatment to the water treatment plants and the water treatment plants may not be able to, to get those things out before they are released back into our waterways. So um, some things you can, you know, people, take to the landfill, and that's not a great disposal route. Um, it is surprising how many people dump their items. <laughs> you know, I live right next to the, I live right next to the river, and it is not uncommon for me to see um, televisions dumped right in the river. Last fall, I saw two of those little riding toys for kids, you know, the ones that have the batteries. They're, they're basically electronics because, you know, they have gas pedals and, um, you know, electronics in them, found two of those in the river near my house. So people dump those items. And when you do that, um, you know, the batteries that are in those, all of the, the acids in those batteries and the hazardous chemicals in those batteries, you're sitting right in the water um, and it's being released directly into that water. If you're dumping them on soil, um, as they get broken, water hits them and those chemicals can make it right into the soil. Either way, whether it's in the soil or the water, it impacts those, those resources pretty negatively. So that's a bad route of disposal. The third disposal route would be to recycle your items. And so there's two um, sort of uh, bullet points in recycling. So what we'd like for you to do is use a regulated recycler, um, one that's been approved um, and accredited. And so what they do is they pull out those precious metals and the critical elements to recycle them, and they dispose of any hazardous materials properly so that they won't make it into the environment. That's ideal. That's what we would like to happen. Um, the, unfortunately, there's also some unregulated recycling, and um, that includes burning and dumping that causes air and land pollution. Um, and, you know, so it really is important to figure out if your recycler is accredited. Um, you know, doesn't happen here as often, but you know, a lot of the things that we send for recycling, if you're not using an accredited recycler, may end up in a third world country. Um, you can look up this video here. It's definitely worth watching. Um, it's called Computer Recycling West Africa Style. It was a BBC News um, uh, video that they did in 2014, but it still occurs today. So this was in uh, Ghana, West Africa. And over there, you know, electronics will be shipped, uh, countries will pay to ship electronics to those countries to be recycled, they say, um, but the recycling that they're doing is not environmentally responsible at all. You can see in the picture there, you know, what they'll do is they'll pick out um, what they can with their hands and then once they've got everything that's easy to extract from the electronics, then they'll put it all in a big pile and they'll burn it. And they'll burn it to get rid of the plastics and anything else. And then they'll pick through that pile to get um, anything else valuable that's in those electronics. And you can see the clouds of smoke, toxic, toxic smoke. Um, you can see those people have on no gloves, they have on no masks. There's children there helping with this. Um, is, is really bad for the environment. So this, the guy in this video, they did some soil testing and they found 30 times the acceptable levels of cadmium in that soil and a hundred times of the maximum dose allowable of lead in that soil. So it's polluting those environments incredibly. And so that's why it's really important to use an accredited recycler if you can. Um, so some of the benefits of you, uh, of a, Recycling electronics, you know, you're saving energy, uh, you're generating revenue, the recycling, recyclables include gold, copper, aluminum, gas, steel, and platinum, all 
have a monetary value, and you're recovering those precious metals to reuse again. So um, some other benefits is that you're conserving natural resources. You know, we talked about mining being so bad for an environment. It could just decimate an environment. Um, and, you know, if you're able to reuse those rare earth minerals and all of those other um, reusable minerals, then um, you're not having to cause the damage to that environment by by mining more of that element. You know, you're reusing it. So you're conserving natural resources, you're reducing environmental pollution, and you're protecting animal and human health, and then you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions all by recycling e-waste and using that, uh, you know, reusing those products. Um, so just kind of to break it down on like a easy to understand level, um, here's some impacts of recycling electronic waste. So for every million cell phones that we recycle, 35 thousand pounds of copper, 772 pounds of silver, 75 pounds of gold, and 33 pounds of palladium can be recovered. And then also recycling 1 million laptops saves the energy equivalent to the electricity used by more than 3,500 homes for a year. So those are um, those figures are from the EPA. Um, so I feel like they are very trustworthy. So Recycling electronics can make a difference. And so that I hope, I hope that you will recycle your electronics. And so to go along with that, we have six tips to reduce your electronics waste and be um, a better steward of your natural resources when using electronics. So uh, tip number one, donate or sell. And some of these are, you know, kind of, um, obvious and then others um, aren't so obvious. So the first one is donate or sell your old electronics. Um, in my town, we have a Habitat for Humanity store that will take electronics. Uh, you might also look for youth, local youth organizations. We have a, um, a organization here in my hometown that um, helps unhoused people. Um, and they are, you know, they need computers to teach people how, you know, to, to teach people basic computer skills so they can go out and get a job and apply for, um, you know, things from the government that they may need. So, so look around your community and see where you can donate your old electronics. Um, you may can also sell some of your old electronics. You can use buy, sell, and trade uh, social media pages. Um, most towns have a, a, a social media page, like a Facebook page, that's a trade page or a items for free page. And so look there and see if you can find one for your own community. The second way that you can um, be a better steward is to buy green products. So buy refurbished products. We just got my daughter a phone and uh, we didn't buy her a new phone, we bought her a refurbished phone. Um, it works just as well, it, uh, it was cheaper. <laughs> and you know, it makes you feel better about um, those, the, the product itself. Um, you can also buy items made from recycled materials, buy Energy Star certified products, um, also buy products that are designed for upgrading and longevity and products that have environmentally sound recycling options. So the, you can look into that uh, environmentally sound recycling options. There's a couple of web pages that kind of go over how well companies recycle um, and you can use that to, to make your purchasing decisions. Uh, you can ex also, number three is you can extend the life of your products by upgrading software instead of buying new products. We don't always need the newest product. You know, a lot of times we can just use what we have and upgrade it. Um, it's hard to convince a, a, you know, a young person of that sometimes, you know, a teenager, but um, we can many times just upgrade software. Um, we can also buy products with extended warranties and buy longer lived products. I know last time that I went, uh, last time my washing machine died, I um, went out and I found one that has a longer life. It's, it's, 
it was actually a commercial um, grade machine. And I've specifically picked that because it's got a longer life. All of the reviews says this, this machine is gonna last you longer um, than the regular homeowner version. So pick those products with longer lives and then also buy protective coverings for small electronics so they're not easily damaged. Things like iPhones need um, protective coverings. Maintain your electronics is number four. Let's use phone cases and spring screen protectors like we just talked about. So we're not having to replace the screens or replace the phones uh, because they got damaged um, and when they got dropped or whatever. Um, another one that I kept running across um, in as far as maintaining your electronics is don't overfill your computer's hard drive. Apparently overfilling the hard drive um, is bad for your computer and will shorten the life of it. Uh, don't overcharge your batteries. Keep your computers clean and dust free. So when we do uh, electronics recycling days, a lot of times people will request that we pull out their hard drive for them and destroy it or give it back to them. And it is amazing. Maybe it's not amazing. It's disgusting <laughs> how much dust is in the back of a, um, a central processing unit, a CPU. Um, you know, and all of that dust makes the computer harder to run. It makes it heat overheat more often and it leads to a shorter life. So just clean the dust out of the back of your computer and that will be helpful to maintain your electronics. Um, check for updates often and keep your virus protection up to date. Five, uh, and this is one that I hadn't considered, um, but using online cloud storage. So, um, you know, Many homes, you know, they always tell you if you've got a computer, you need a backup. Some, you need some that information backed up just in case anything happens on your computer. And a lot of people, including me, had always used just a small, um, you know, one terabyte hard drive, external hard drive, and I'd back everything up on that hard drive. Um, and, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, so we'd back everything up on that hard drive. Uh, but now, you know, there are um, clouds that will store all of that data for you. And so if you store in a cloud instead of in a hard drive, that's one less piece of equipment you have. And that may not seem like much, but one less, uh, you know, if you think about all the people on your block and say they probably have a, you know, external hard drive as well. That's how many external hard drives that we have reduced from our waste stream. You know, there's less that we've put on the market and less that we have to dispose of eventually. So online cloud storage is a great way to reduce the number of devices that you are using. And then recycle your electronics with accredited recyclers. Um, so a lot of people say, well, where do I find those? Well, first off, uh, talk to your local municipality about your local municipal waste company. Who handles your regular trash? Talk to them, and they could probably tell you who are the re accredited recyclers. You can also go to sites like Earth 911 or the EPA um, recycle um, page to see things like recycling donation, electronics donation and recycling. Um, there are some other larger companies that will take small electronics like Staples and Best Buy and Target will take small electronics. But um, before you haul your uh, flat screen TV down to Staples, you should probably call them and make sure they are one of the stores that will <laughs> accept that um, those items. Um, but traditionally, those three have been great at, at recycling. Um, and kind of just a little bit more about the, the certified recyclers. So the EPA certified recyclers, uh, that's kind of what you want to look for if you're looking for a recycler on your own. So these are companies that have gone through the process and the paperwork um, and are checked, they're checked and certified and then rechecked after they're certified to make sure that they're meeting environmental standards at a very high level um, and they're safely managing used electronics. So always look for those, um, those EPA certified recyclers and you can find those on the EPA website. 
Okay, so now that we've talked about you need to recycle your electronics, let's think about what you need to do before you recycle your electronics. Um, first off, if you are worried, you can remove and destroy your hard drive. Um, you can either, some people remove it and keep it. They've got a big pile of hard drives from over the years. Some people remove it and just hammer it until it rattles. And once it rattles, then um, nobody's gonna get anything off of there. Um, if you've got an EPA accredited recycler, they are going to wipe any machines that come into their facility themselves. You can always ask uh, as you're dropping your materials off if they will they will wipe those hard drives. And, and normally the answer is yes. In fact, if any, any of your information made it out of your, their facility, then they would be um, under the threat of severe, severe fines. So they are very careful with your hard drives. Uh, and then also you need to remove the batteries and recycle those separately. A lot of times batteries would be handled with the household hazardous waste instead of the, um, um, instead of the, the electronics. So go ahead and take those batteries out. I mean, they could do it at the facility, but that's one less step for them. Let's do it, you know, make their um, job more streamlined and effective. Um, by going ahead and removing the batteries them yourself. So you may be asking, where can I drop off my electronics? You got me all fired up. Well, um, there are three uh, electronics drop off days. You've already missed one, but there are two coming up. One is May 14th and one is June 11th in your area. So you just take those items, you put these items here on the right, you put them in your trunk, um, you drive through the line, you pop your trunk, they take them out, and uh, you just go on about your business. You don't even have to get out of your car. So you can bring uh, papers to shred, but you can also bring all of these other electronic devices. So I would encourage you to take advantage of those two, put those dates on your calendar. If you have questions about what you should bring and what you shouldn't bring, you can call the Jefferson County Stormwater Program. There's their number right there. And they can break it all down for you. All right, and if you have questions about our electronic waste management program, um, uh, we have a couple of agents. Uh, we have me, I'm up in North Alabama. Dr. Carnita Garner, she's our state environmental specialist. She covers the whole state. Roosevelt Robinson is in um, the Montgomery area. And then we are hiring for the Jefferson County area right now. So hopefully within the next few months, we'll have somebody that can assist you with that sort of programming, um, electronic waste management programming in your county. Um, here's my information. You're welcome to call if you have questions. And I would ask you to please take our survey. You can click on that little code there or you can use the link there. Um, and last, I'm gonna come back to this one, but I wanna tell you about two other programs that we have coming up. One is May 13th, that is next Friday. You may be interested in, uh, we're gonna be covering microplastics, tiny pollutant, big problem. And then on June 10th, we've got another session on climate change in Alabama. So if you go to the link at the bottom of that page, or you can go to our website, aces.edu, and click you know, in the search bar, Eco-Friendly Fridays, it'll bring up that whole series and you can register. Um, I'm really excited about these two sessions coming up. There's some that we haven't really covered very well through extension. So with that, I'm gonna put the survey code back up and answer any questions that have come in.